This is Malik Cook from the University of Colorado, and the topic today is translational research, tips from the trenches. Let's start off with a simple outline of this talk. I'll discuss where innovation comes from, steps to get started and to keep going, real world examples. I'll try to focus on some of the mistakes that I've made along the way, and then I'll finish off with five tips for you to consider. The first question is pretty basic. Where does innovation come from? The simple answer is that most innovation comes from doctors, fecal emulsification from Kelman, drainage devices from multiple doctors and researchers, OCT from Joel Schumann, Pliafito, Fujimoto, Wong, Lin, and Swanson, and MIGS devices from various practitioners around the world. Innovation also applies to many of the devices we use on an everyday basis, which might not get the attention of the devices on the previous slide. These include the Cybal Chopper, the Akahoshi Pre-Chopper, Iris Hooks from Jean Duan, and Fechner Forceps. One question you should ask yourself is, do you have a good idea? New does not always mean better. New does not mean practical. And new does not mean viable. Innovation comes from identifying an unmet need. Is there a better way or a new way to do this? Is there a safer way to achieve the goal? The real question becomes, how do we get from idea to solution? How does innovation reach the patient? It all starts with an idea. Unfortunately, this is usually the easy part. The majority of inventions remain conceptual. Major limitations include time constraints and lack of know-how. It's just not something that we're trained to do as medical students and trainees and subsequently physicians in practice, whether it's private practice or academia. There's also a lack of funding and fear of the unknown. Physicians are generally a risk-averse bunch. But how can you push forward? I'm going to give you a tale of three technologies that came from my laboratory. And through that discussion, cover class three devices with PMA pathway, early stage novel material development, and a class one device with FDA registration. One of the first technologies to come out of my laboratory was part of a company called Clarvista Medical. In this case, what we set out to do was to deliver a lens that had the capability of exchanging the optic if needed. The platform also allowed for a more stable, effective lens position. You can see here an animation of this device with the base delivered first, followed by delivering the optic which is placed over the base and then positioned into the groove of the base with a simple Sinsky hook. We believe that stability would allow us to achieve better outcomes with primary surgery, and the modular design allows for an insurance policy to address future needs. ShapeTech was another company that came out of our laboratories with the unmet need of IOLs requiring new materials that could balance small incision injectability with stable mechanical characteristics and long-term optical clarity. This balance was extremely difficult to achieve with materials that were on the market, and innovation in intraocular lens material was lacking at the time. The potential solutions that we explored led us to shape memory polymers, which are a heterogeneous class of materials that are not fully explored for ophthalmic use. And the third device category involved the designing of a novel tool to excise trabecular meshwork in patients who required a decrease in their intraocular pressure. The work on this tool resulted in a device that was placed on the market to treat glaucoma. And I'll come back to this device in a little bit. Setting up for success, breaking through from conceptual to development requires a time commitment that often starts with research. You should define the unmet need and do your market research. Again, not something that physicians are used to doing, but something that's necessary. I now spend a lot more time talking to colleagues and seeking more market information before pursuing ideas. Has it been attempted before? Prior art search, looking at patents and literature from the past. Can you build it? Is it manufacturable? And if all goes well, it's time to protect the idea with a provisional application through the patent process and then to move on to next steps. Your prior art search should include multiple steps. It's important to start out on firm ground. Seek a patent attorney who is familiar in the space. Talk to others who have been through the process of patent writing and discuss mistakes, too narrow, too broad, freedom to operate issues. Money is often a major limitation, but a provisional application is usually around $3,000, which can be affordable. When it comes to the device build, sometimes you can do this in-house, sometimes literally in-house, but that's usually something that happens with IT and not with medical devices. You can seek a contract manufacturer, and in my opinion, you should seek partners who are local so that you can have oversight, and also where you can manage the spend on the early stages of device build. 
Proof of concept devices can be very simple with the point being to learn and fail fast. Seek larger partners who can scale up production in the future and explore the scale up process. This isn't something you want to find out deep into the process of developing devices. When you start working with people, you should ask about their ability to scale up production. Sources of funding is a common topic among entrepreneurs. You can self-fund with the pros of no dilution or headache. The cons, easier said than done, and knowing when to stop spending your own money is very difficult. Friends and family, the pros, you can get more money involved with your proof of concept stage. On the con side, don't do business with friends and family. Angel investors on the pro side, deeper pockets and sometimes good advice, depending on who you're working with. On the con side, there's dilution and usually bad advice and unrealistic expectations from angel investors compared to professional investors and venture capital firms. You can seek university funding on the pro side, no dilution and higher percent of success as far as getting the funding. On the con side, typically on your own and red tape of the university is not conducive to moving quickly. You can look for federal grants like SBIR grants on the pro side, high rate of success, but they can be cumbersome and time consuming. And you can also look at VC seed rounds. You can get a serious partner and advisors, and it's also validation of your idea. On the con side, welcome to dilution. Enjoy the ride. From a regulatory standpoint, a major factor in what we do right now is what the FDA instructs us to do. It's difficult to learn each system globally. The FDA website is a resource, but often a maze of information. Talk to industry colleagues about their experiences, and I find them often very happy to help. Seek an FDA consultant. It's money spent today that will save money spent tomorrow. And remember, focus. It's going to be very easy to lose focus along the way. That proverbial squirrel that you see in the tree, try and stay away from it and focus on what you need to do. One question that comes up is to partner or not to partner. You can look for strategic partnerships. You can get affirmation of the idea. However, they're extremely slow to execute, loss of control when working with industry. And I recommend this only for mature ideas. To partner with venture or other investors, as above, with the potential to remain engaged and build value. And this is often the course that I take. You can also go it alone early on, especially if you have the finances to do it. Back to the three ideas that I mentioned. With Clarevista Medical, the decision was made to sell to Alcon prior to phase three. The cost of phase three would have diluted the team further. We were only five years in, which was a quick exit for an intracular lens. Alcon was the biggest commercial footprint in IOLs at that time. The price was right. And to be honest, it just felt right at the time. Now, on Shape Tech side, we decided something different. The decision was to partner with AMO, now Johnson & Johnson Vision. We agreed to a milestone-driven joint development agreement. Resources are pooled and expertise is shared. We had access to knowledge and to a built-in customer. It allowed for increased bandwidth to expand other work, and it allowed us to learn from the inside. The third device was the dual-blade device, which we developed mostly in-house at the university. It allowed us to iterate and enhance and then repeat quickly. It gave us proof of concept, and we ended up licensing this to New World Medical. On the pro side, we had full control along the way. We were able to build value in the device and keep our own pace. On the con side, because we kept it in the university for a long time, this was a low resource environment with red tape and uncertainty about a partner, but it worked out in the end with licensing to New World Medical. I do want to mention this briefly that the innovation triad is extremely important. Most of us occupy the upper left-hand side of clinicians, but we can't do this alone without basic scientists and business leaders. So I would advocate for finding good people with similar personalities and similar values to partner with early on. Five tips that I've learned along the way. Navigate your reality. Are you in academics versus private practice? Do you have to deal with the tech transfer office? Do you have to assign your rights for invention? Can you control rights along the way? Who can you seek funding from? And who do you need assistance from? Patent and non-patent prior art search is extremely important. Look at the Google patent resource as well as the WIPO websites. Consider regulatory early on in the process. Will this be a 510K process, which is easier than a PMA process? You should be familiar with this lingo. Remember that most ideas like this will be a six to eight year road prior to partnering or getting on the market, choose the right people from the beginning and you're going to be more likely to be successful. And then remember the innovation triad, talk to others and build a team with different skill sets than your own. And I'll add one more here that is extremely important. Life is really short, so make sure you have fun along the way. Consider visiting keogt.com for other educational materials. 
And you can follow this lecture and other lectures on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram channels as noted in this slide. Thank you for your time.